Join the only roundtable podcast in compliance with five of the top commentators in compliance. Mike Volkov brings 35 years of legal experience. Matt Kelly is the founder and editor of Radical Compliance. Jay Rosen is Mr. Monitor, who knows his way around the culture of compliance. And Jonathan Armstrong, a partner at Cordery Compliance in London, rounds out this top group of compliance practitioners. Check out the rants and shout out at the end of each episode. Hosted by Tom Fox, the voice of compliance. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. In this episode of Everything Compliance, we have the full quintet back Jonathan Armstrong talks about the conviction by the SFO in the Unoil case and how the SFO now finds itself in controversy. Matt Kelly takes a look at recent U.S. corruption cases and what it means for compliance. Mike Volkoff considers two recent OFAC enforcement actions involving Amazon and Accentra. Jay Rosen takes a look at telemedicine and the compliance issues that arise from this new strategy by doctors. And finally, Jonathan Marks talks about what parallels he sees in the development of compliance professionals and the compliance discipline that he lived through in the world of internal audit. It's a fascinating uh, podcast this week. I know you'll enjoy it. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Mike Volkoff, you've recently written about a couple of interesting OFAC enforcement actions. What do, do Amazon and Accentra tell us?
So, Mike, it sounds like, um, I don't want to say these were routine, but the lessons to be learned really could point towards, certainly with Amazon, the quality of your screening software. But uh, admonitions against shell companies are something that OFAC, DOJ, SEC, and a wide variety of federal regulators continually remind us about. Jonathan Marks, what's on your mind? What's on my mind, Tom? Well, let's talk about internal audit and compliance today. How about that? So you want to talk about, I know we kind of chit-chatted a little bit about the sort of the evolution of compliance and the journey that compliance has been on over the last couple of years. And you and I have had numerous conversations. Um, actually, we all have numerous conversations about the, I think, the, the similarities that uh, the, or the struggles that compliance is actually dealing with today, much like internal audit had maybe 15, 20, 25 years ago. Um, you know, I can recall, you know, very early on in my career, you know, we're going back 30 years when, um, you know, I was dealing with internal audit. And internal audit really was, let's just call them what they were. They weren't also ran sort of a necessary evil. And, you know, maybe they did three or four audits a year. Um, I participated in some audit committee meetings back then. I was a lot younger than I am today, obviously. But, um, you know, every now and again, I got invited to go to an audit committee meeting. And, you know, they really weren't taken very seriously. You know, a lot of times it was just um, they were put on some special projects for, which were really meaningless. But as far as accountability goes and as far as actually having a real role in driving um, accountability within the organization with regards to internal controls and policies and procedures really didn't exist. Just It just did not. And so, you know, you started to see compliance come along as this function, this, this separate function. And I know we've had conversations about this, and it, it almost seems to be, for me, to be some of the same things. You know, lack of resources, um, you know, sort of some organizations take compliance serious, some don't. Um, with regards to skills and training, it, it, there's sort of a confusion as to what really um, a chief compliance officer should look like, um, um, what type of credentials should they have. It was same as internal auditors way back when. You know, how do you, how do you, where does the compliance function fit within the organization? Now, internal audit was a little bit more defined just because of the sort of the name of, you know, sort of the name of the function or the purpose of the key roles of that particular type of um, activity within a company. But now today, you know, compliance is struggling as to where they fit. Do they belong with legal, without legal? Who do they report to, you know, functionally and, and actually? So um, I, I see a lot of the same things going on today with compliance. Um, and, you know, sort of a now for tomorrow type prediction, you know, I do see at some point, and again, and again I know we've talked about this before, you know, more of a symbiotic relationship, not, not that some organizations don't have those already, between internal audit and compliance going forward, just because of the very nature of the specific things that they actually do. Um, you know, if you look and, and try to understand what their roles are uh, from, a, from an internal audit perspective, they're supposed to be independent and objective, you know, and provide assurance and advice on all matters related to the achievement of the objectives of the organization. When you look at compliance, and that's really independent assurance. Uh, when you look at compliance, um, compliance, a little bit different, um, uh, a little bit different, but, you know, it, you know, assurance, they're really assurance and validation, adherence to internal and external policies, guidance, rules, laws, and internal controls. 
And they're the ones that should be promoting the code of conduct and behaviors that encourage accountability and doing the right thing at all times. And if they're, if internal audit and compliance are not in lockstep, and for those of you out there that are listening you're, and, and you follow me or you don't follow me, one of the things that I keep saying and, or have said before is that if you, took at le- if you take a look at legal compliance and internal audit, and those things are not harmonious and, and really collaborating appropriately, you create what I call the Bermuda Triangle, which is really a, a recipe for disaster. Um, and so, you know, internal audit and compliance have a really uh, significant job in a lot of organizations. And specifically, it's making sure that management remains accountable um, you know, for the for their particular action. So I, I see a lot of a lot of similarities today and a lot of struggles today from a compliance perspective that internal audit has experienced and continues to experience, you know, um, even to even today. Jonathan, uh, do you see now compliance moving along this path to uh, becoming as established as you and your internal co- audit colleagues? have become over the past uh, 15 or 20 years? I do. I think it's important. I think if you look at, if you take a look at the governance components of an organization and one of them being, you know, uh, business practices and ethics, you know, I think that internal audit played somewhat of a role there, but I think compliance plays more of a role there. I think the thing that internal audit really is focusing in on now on is, you know, it's, it's not only identifying those risks, but it's also communicating those risks throughout the organization and making sure that, you know, from a, from a monitoring perspective, um, that there's there, those things are properly looked at. And, you know, as we all know now, because of the new guidance that came out, which, you know, wasn't new to many of us, but, you know, all of these lessons learned and this giant feedback loop that needs to be created in order to continue to enhance programs, you know, I think is important not only from an internal audit, but also from a compliance perspective. So I do see, I do see compliance actually becoming more structured if, if it's not already but a more structured function with specific roles and responsibilities. And, and actually, you know, with key accountability between both sets of functions within the company, both internal audit and compliance going forward. Jonathan, um, as many of our listeners know, and you certainly know, I'm from Houston and Enron was the seminal event around accounting fraud in my professional career. Was that really a, an inflection point? for internal audit uh, receive, uh, becoming, uh, getting a seat at the table? Was it moving towards that position and, and accelerated by Enron, or did all of this start with Enron? Um, I think that if you take a look at WorldCom, Enron, Adelphia, HealthSouth, and all those organizations from, you know, what was then or had internal audit, I think that the Enron situation certainly – help tip the scales with regards to the the um, passing of Sarbanes-Oxley in, in, uh, in 2002 and then being enacted in, in 2004. I think what happened in 2004, organizations looked around and they said, well, who within our organization can help us, you know, um, marshal out the implementation of Sarbanes-Oxley? And obviously the first choice was probably internal audit. But what we've learned from that was, is, you know, many of my Many of my colleagues say that the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was the full employment act for a lot of the accountants out there, which they probably were not wrong. But many of the individuals that actually helped with that and helped try to establish internal audit, really, it was really plowing new ground, really didn't know what, you know, really didn't know what was to be done. Um, all we knew was, is that, you know, from that point forward, some of the projects that we were working on or the way that we went about creating our audit plan may or not have been risk-based, um, may or not have, you know, contained certain elements that would actually help drive enterprise value and the like. And I think what happened when, when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed, it sort of put the onus and the impetus back on management um, to make sure that they were focusing on internal controls over financial reporting. And the external auditors certainly played a role there, too. So I think the combination of the two, that one-two punch there, really helped drive the development of internal audit. Um, into a new height that I've never seen before, starting back, you know, after after the fall of Enron in 2002, 2003, and then going into 2004 with regards to Sarbanes-Oxley. So I think the answer to your question, Tom, is I, I think it had a lot to do with it. Um, I think it was long overdue. I think there was a lot of lip service um, at the board level. I think a lot of the boards, you know, kind of phoned it in. 
I think what this did was, again, it placed accountability. I think the key word here is accountability. You know, management has to be accountable. And um, even today, it drives me bananas that, you know, you look at organizations and you look at internal audit and, you know, you could do, you know, you could look at barriers, obstacles, hurdles and whatever, which, you know, really are defining what the things are with regards to risk. And you can have the best risk program in the world. But if management is not paying attention to any of these things and really doesn't follow through with these things, for example, if you put a control in, if it's not monitored, in my opinion, it's probably useless. And so you, how do you do that? And if management doesn't do that, if internal audit does that, then their independence comes into question. So, you know, the whole thing to me is this whole concept of accountability, which is one of the things that I think really is, is, is starting to drive. And I think what compliance is doing, you know, in the enforcement of code of conduct and, the, you know, making sure that people are trained appropriately and making sure that we're in compliance with rules and regulations, I think that it's really helping drive accountability, but I just don't see that accountability there yet. And I think if you trace back the organizations that have failed, even today, some of these big, we just talked about Novartis a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things I said was, where was internal audit? And, you know, I, I'm not saying that internal audit wasn't involved in the organization, but, you know, how is it that they did not understand what was going on there? It just, it mystifies me. So, um, you know, I know that's sort of a convoluted answer to your question, but, um, you know, I think it helps drive home the point that I, I do think that I do think it helped shape internal audit. I think it will continue to shape internal audit. I think every deferred prosecution and non-prosecution agreement today helps shape compliance. Um, and I also think every failure within the company helps shape compliance. So it's not only what we know, it's what we don't know. And I think that's why the DOJ went back and said, hey, you really need to take these lessons learned and create a cadence with regard to your program as you build your journey and create, you go from an ad hoc to more of an optimized approach, you know, not only from an internal audit perspective, but certainly from a compliance perspective. And Jonathan, could I bring that forward to 2020? Uh, for the compliance function, because in compliance, as we record this today in on July 31st, uh, obviously with uh, COVID-19 and the coronavirus, we've seen the acceleration of trends that were percolating along. And, and in the compliance function, that biggest trend was the use of data, or I think you've characterized it as business intelligence. Do you see the compliance function now coming out of COVID-19 as really uh, speeding up their movement towards integrating uh, enterprise risk management, a much broader and ho more holistic approach, as you saw internal audit do over the past several years? Um, I think it's going to help. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to get us to where we need to be. Again, you know, if you take a look at the compliance function and say, oh, there is one of their key responsibilities is assurance and validation. You know, the way we validate things a lot of times is through data. Um, and, you know, I think if they, if, if I'm sitting in compliance today and I'm wondering, how do I do this? You know, how do I, how do I become more effective? How do I get in the data to see what's going on? I think, I think that's critical. You got to remember management is the one that are executing those transactions. It's not compliance. So if, if compliance wants to make sure, again, provide assurance and validation that these transactions conform with internal and external policies, procedures, guidance, rules, and, and the like, they're going to have to find a way to monitor them. And the way they monitor them is going to be through data. And that's why I think it's, it's foolish to talk about compliance in a setting like this without really talking about internal audit. And I think that's what really kind of led us to this conversation. Because again, you know, if you go back and you look at, um, you look at what the guidance says and some of the things that came out, they talk about the compliance function being properly resourced. And it's not only properly resourced, like I say, with tools and 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 the right and, and and people. It's also resourced with the right skills and capabilities. So, with regards to data or data, yes, I agree that it's going to start to help move the needle with regards to, you know, not only finding the right data, but then using that data effectively. Um, I think the biggest mistake that organizations are making today is they're they're sort of this rush to kind of get into the weeds with regards to the data and they're not thinking about the objective at the end like what is this really going to provide us and you know how can we use this effectively you know and, and anything that we're doing you know we spend a ton of time you know trying to figure out from a from a data perspective once we get the data what is it going to be used for and how are we going to use it and you know is it something that we can use to help monitor 
you know, going forward. So I think, you know, I think there's a, I think there's a long way to go, but I think we're on the right track. Jonathan Armstrong, the serious fraud office had a rare but much needed win recently with the conviction of two former Una oil employees for bribery and corruption. Yet, uh, even with this win, the serious fraud office has found itself in a controversy, uh, up to and including commentary by the judge in the case. Uh, what can you tell us about this case? Is it uh, a harbinger of uh, difficulties for both the serious fraud office and Lisa Osofsky, or is it much ado about nothing? Uh, I don't think it's much ado about nothing. And I think there's a, as we lawyers say, a precise concatenation of circumstances that are making this a difficult few weeks ahead for the SFO. So first of all, the good news. Um, in the Una Oil Con uh, case, they managed to secure convictions. In trying circumstances, to be fair, the trial was suspended because of COVID concerns, and then it returned with a socially distant jury. These trials uh, are, are still before juries in the uh, UK, despite uh, uh, Boris Johnson's attempts to tinker with the system. And they did uh, secure uh, a, um, uh, a guilty plea from one individual and uh, secured convictions of two uh, in front of the jury after a 10-week trial. The, the case has continued to be a little bit messy in that the three of them could not be sentenced together. We've had two sentencing hearings already. Uh, one of the bribe payers was sentenced to five years in jail, the second three years in jail. The uh, person who pleaded guilty will be sentenced on the 8th of October. There's likely to be a retrial in this case of one of the defendants where the jury failed to reach a verdict. And the SFO has indicated that it might join other people into that new trial, which will likely take place in January 2021. And the judge did give the SFO some time to think about adding uh, an additional defendant or defendants. So that's the good news. The case, uh, as I say, was quite a uh, substantial case. It principally involved bribes in Iraq, but also covered Nigeria, Angola, Azerbaijan, Democrat Democratic Republic of the Congo, Iran, Kazakhstan, Libya, and Syria. Now, the other part of the case, however, that that is unsatisfactory, if you like, was this um, seemingly unseemly falling out between the SFO and the authorities in the US. And effectively, Una Oil, the company at the heart of this investigation, uh, was owned by and still is owned by the uh, Asani family, the founder and chairman uh, Atta Asani and his son's uh, Cyrus and Saman. And um, Cyrus and, uh, 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 and Saman um, have been um, uh, pleaded, have pleaded guilty to bribery charges in the US. And they also uh, expect to be sentenced in October 2020. Now, it seems as if, as I've said, there's been some, um, let's say, lack of cooperation between the US and the UK. And the criticism of Ms. Ozofsky, the uh, SFO's director, was over the contact that she had with a, a, special, a former special supervisory special agent from the US Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, an individual called David Tinsley. He'd gone on to set up a private intelligence agency, and it seemed that he represented the Azanis, and he seemed to be trying to, we would use the word, butter up uh, the director of the SFO and had a dialogue with her 
via text message where he was effectively pushing for the Azanis to be dealt with in the US rather than the UK. And as a sort of uh, token of that bargain, he said that he could secure guilty pleas from Al Jara, the individual who did plead guilty, and Akel, the defendant who was sentenced to five years in prison. Now, Akel's lawyers uh, had a uh, pre-trial hearing in February, which uh, was not allowed to be reported at the time, but the judge has now allowed that to be reported. And he effectively, uh, Akel's counsel, effectively said that the way in which the trial was progressing was unfair because of this back-channel contact between Tinsley and uh, Azovsky. And the judge said that uh, Azovsky was, quote, vulnerable to flattery in her dealings with him and that Tinsley uh, was, quote, talking up her talents. Now, the court heard that Tinsley had started exchanging messages, as I said, largely, it seems, SMS messages rather than emails through the SFO's uh, network in September 2018. And this seemed to be despite advice from her subordinates at the SFO that this communication should stop. And the judge has uh, recommended that the SFO hold an internal review of their director's contact with Tinsley to see the lessons that could be learned. Now, it seems that Akel may uh, uh, has somehow obtained transcripts of conversations, which seemingly were covertly recorded from meetings with Tinsley, where Tinsley was pushing him to plead guilty and cooperate with the authorities, it seems possibly as some sort of a potential bargain to deliver his head to the UK courts in exchange for the Azanis going to the US. And uh, uh, Akel's lawyer in court said that Azovsky had sent text to Tinsley like a teenager who had just found a new best friend. Now, it's important to say that the judge said that he found no evidence that the SFO had acted in bad faith, nor that he had done anything unlawful. Uh, and the SFO emphasized that in its statement. It said that it would renew its um, its conduct. But in some respects, things have got a little worse since for two reasons. Uh, first of all, it seems that the uh, that complaints have been made to the uh, Attorney General and to the Bar Standards Council about the director's conduct. And secondly, the SFO has recently been the subject of a, a separate investigation, which is routine, by the Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate, which is almost like Mr. Marx's uh, internal audit committee, but for the SFO. Now, uh, let's take each of these in turn. Um, first of all, uh, the recently appointed Attorney General is apparently going to look into, uh, uh, into this whole uh, mess. She's only recently appointed in February 2020. She's a Boris Johnson appointee. It's fair to say she is not regarded as the most brilliant attorney general we have ever had. Her specialty seems to be in planning, judicial review, and immigration. So not the talents which would spring to mind as somebody uh, involved in the uh, smooth running of the uh, prosecution system and the criminal justice system. So it seems at least that a complaint has been made to the Attorney General who would be expected to look at this. And that might be instead of or in addition to the SFO's own internal investigation. But then in addition, uh, Mrs. Zofsky is, is, uh, is qualified in the US and in England and Wales and we understand that a complaint has been made to the Bar Standards Board about her conduct uh, as well. 
uh, and that complaint says that she's been guilty of serious professional misconduct. Now, as I've said, uh, just because a complaint is made doesn't mean to say that she is guilty. And she, like anybody else, is entitled to put the full facts uh, before uh, anybody and uh, and put her side of the events, which we've not yet heard. But this comes at the same time, as I said, uh, as this Crown Prosecution Service Inspectorate. Now, why this is particularly uh, uh, concerning, I think, is part of the uh, criticism involves the uh, lack of technology at the SFO. And this is a drum that the SFO have been beating for a few years now. And we've talked about it before in these podcasts, the previous director talking about the substantial investment the SFO had made in technology. Uh, The SFO's annual report trumpets the fact that it has a chief technology officer who's running all of these systems. And it says, and the, the last annual report says, and I quote, technology is at the heart of the SFO's business. But contrast that with its performance during the pandemic. Apparently, individuals from the SFO have been forced to join court hearings audio only because they have no way of uh, joining by video conference, by Zoom or Skype or Teams, and that as a result, hearings have had to be held with technology joining everybody up so that the judge or whoever could see them, save for the SFO participants who could only join uh, audio, apparently because of the technology constraints of their network. So for an organization that says, quote, technology is at the heart of our business, to not be able to join a Zoom call in this day and age would seem somewhat surprising. Now, of course, part of that relates to the previous watch, but you would think that most businesses have transitioned from the in-office working to home office working relatively seamlessly. And it's somewhat worrying that the SFO, an organization with technology at the heart of its business, has not been able to transition as well. So unfortunately, I think it is a a, a difficult uh, few weeks, few months to come. That's not to denigrate their uh, uh, handling of the Una oil trial, which which seems to have got uh, to a conclusion in in challenging circumstances. But I think there are obviously some fundamental issues that do need to be looked at. Jonathan, uh, I was not a fan of Theresa May, and I was not a fan of Theresa May before she became prime minister because of her attacks on the SFO. Mm-hmm. However, after doing a little research on this issue and now listening to your recitation of facts, I'm beginning to think Theresa May may have been on to something. Um, what do you think this might mean if we take the SFO equation out of it for Lisa Osofsky herself uh, as a Yank, as an American uh, heading the SFO? Has that caused, if not um, consternation, something more in the UK uh, legal community? And does this really portend, uh, if she did make a misstep in judgment, that uh, she might uh, leave the scene? I don't think it is xenophobia from the legal community, certainly. I mean, we are used to having non-UK you know, regulators and, and prosecutors. Elizabeth Denham, for example, the a current uh, information commissioner is is Canadian. The uh, recently retired governor of the Bank of England was also Canadian. So I don't think it's xenophobia at the uh, at the heart of the legal profession. I think it was perhaps an unusual uh, appointment to pick somebody, um, uh, you know, whose primary focus, if you like, has been uh, in the U.S. And I think 
a, a number of people had said prior to the appointment that she would have to understand the differences between the way in which cases are prosecuted in the US versus the UK and and you know back channel communications and plea bargaining and all of that sort of thing might be acceptable on your side of the pond but traditionally it hasn't been acceptable on ours and whether or not these things went on we're always conscious in the UK that you know justice uh, not only has to be done but it has to be seen to be done and the fact that people are perceiving that uh, there's been something underhand is not helpful particularly when we have had uh, allegations that the SFO have been taking shortcuts in the past with the Chengis litigation, for example, with the erosion of privilege in, in ENRC. And what, what you hoped would have happened is that you would get a, a, a new director that would come in like Caesar's wife beyond uh, impeachment. And unfortunately, that's turned out not to be the case. And I think you're right, Tom, that then reflects on the organization. And, and in some respects, unfairly, I think, you know, just because, uh, I don't know, the, the manager of the uh, Houston Oilers uh, has deficiencies, we don't say let's disband the Houston Oilers. I think we do need that element of focus on serious fraud. We had a very detailed report, the Roskill report, that said that. Uh, but but uh, and we shouldn't take shortcuts, as Boris Johnson uh, is is trying to, you know, in terms of uh, changing the rules, reducing jury trials, bringing in emergency courts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need a robust director of the SFO who's prepared to uh, uh, ensure that trials are fair, that defendants rights are respected, but still gets convictions when uh, people have been at it. Jonathan, if I could go back to one of your early uh, comments around, I think I wrote this right, the unseeming, unseeming fallout between the serious fraud office and U.S. authorities around the U.S. authorities seemingly snapping up the Asante brothers from Monaco and taking them to the United States, getting them to plead guilty, and then debriefing them, basically turning them uh, as witnesses for uh, 12 months of interrogations, literally under the nose of the SFO who are trying to extradite them. Uh, how, how did that come to happen from your perspective? Uh, I'm not sure. And I don't, I don't know that we have all of the facts out in the open. What I hear is that the SFO are a little peeved because they sent the information to the US in the spirit of cooperation and brotherhood. And then, if you like, they were uh, overtaken at the first corner on the racetrack by a faster car. But whether that's the case, I don't know. Maybe we'll find that out in the uh, sentencing hearings uh, in October. Uh, I, I'm not sure we will know the full story anytime soon. So in a, another podcast, uh, James Kukios and I talked about the Asante brothers' criminal information, and one of his observations was they had pled guilty to one count, which would limit their uh, sentencing to a maximum of five years, assuming they get some credit for their cooperation, and they basically plead that down to a very low sentence. Will that further acerbate uh, these ruffled feathers with the United Kingdom? I think it will. And in particular, I think it will uh, exacerbate issues with with Akel, particularly if he's got five years and his boss, who he says was more responsible, gets significantly less, then I think that will uh, let's just say, spoil any karma he has left. 
and um and and you've got to have some sympathy with that really haven't you if he's if he is the you know obeying his master's instructions and yet he ends up with five times the penalty that that would seem to be unjust i have to say for ex- uh, i have to say for the record that he uh is exploring an appeal I, and i believe has indicated that he will appeal this is something we may uh, have to visit with you again on in the future, Jonathan. Yes, absolutely. Jay Rosen, you and your affiliated monitors colleagues have been looking at telemedicine in the age of coronavirus and particularly around some of the compliance issues. What have you all uh, sort of ascertained from this exploration? Thanks, Tom. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in an unprecedented series of actions by government regulators to allow for the expansion of telemedicine. Although those actions have resulted in the expansion that proponents were hoping for, whether their expansion will be sustained in the longer term is a bit less clear. Uh, in 1997, here's some background, uh, Medicare began reimbursement for tele medicine services following the passage of the Balanced Budget Act with hope that patients in rural communities and those without reasonable access to medical specialists could receive adequate medical evaluations and thus improved health care at a reasonable cost. Telemedicine is simply defined as the remote delivery of health care services, and there are three types, interactive medicine, which includes audio and video communications tool allowing patients and physicians to communicate in real time, store and forward technologies that collect images and data to be transmitted and interpreted later, and remote patient monitoring. Remote patient monitoring tools communicate biometric data, such as blood sugar or blood pressure, allowing remote caregivers to monitor patients that reside at home by using medical, mobile medical devices. Prior to COVID-19, telemedicine had not achieved the wide use and popularity that its supporters anticipated. But now telehealth is bridging bridging the gap between people, physicians, and health systems, enabling everyone, especially symptomatic patients, to stay home and communicate with physicians through virtual channels. This helps to reduce the spread of the virus to mass populations and the medical staff manning the front lines. Before COVID-19, The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, limited Medicare requirements for virtual services to a narrow set of circumstances, which typically required the patient to ironically leave his or her home to receive services. On March 13, 2020, with COVID-19 sweeping the nation, the Secretary of Health and Human Services used a waiver of authority granted by Section 1113 of the Social Security Act to permit CMS to expand the permissible range of services provided by telemedicine, which qualified for federal reimbursement. The two most significant relaxations allow the provision of telehealth services, regardless of one zip code and within the recipient's own home. One of the goals of expanding access to telemedicine during the pandemic was to specifically allow patients to seek medical advice without risking exposure to infectious diseases. Allowing telephone consultation also supports guidance from the CDC to have patients call their healthcare provider before seeking in-person care. It's important to remember that changes implemented by executive orders in response to COVID-19 will expire by the operation of law once this crisis has hopefully subsided. Longer term changes will require legislative or more permanent regulatory action. Will there be a demand for this? There has been no ability to examine patient outcomes for those who have utilized telemedicine during the crisis and no true measure yet of how many people chose to utilize telemedicine once that option was presented to them. But the initial evidence regarding the increased use of telemedicine is staggering. For example, the number of telemedicine visits conducted by the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, which is the largest medical care provider in its region, jumped from 250 per day in early March to nearly 9,500 per day by mid-April, a staggering increase of 3,800%. Prior to COVID-19, 
UPMC's endocrinology department was conducting about eight telemedicine appointments weekly since the de pandemic developed, that number suddenly has jumped to about 500. Whether the demand for telemedicine services outlasts the pandemic, necessitating more permanent rule changes, has not been seen. The CARES Act provided funding to solidify telemedicine's infrastructure by awarding $200 million through the Federal Communications Commission to medical groups to help them install the technology and fund broadband installations. On February 10th of this year, on the day prior to the coronavirus being designated COVID-19 by the World Health Organization, Michael Cassidy Esquire in the Med blog wrote, you can now tell that telemedicine is a mature industry because it has achieved enough critical mass that fraud has started and the OIG is beginning to prosecute. Cassidy's focus was on two major federal prosecutions related to telehealth, which had occurred in the previous year for kickback and fraudulent billing schemes related to durable medical equipment. Prior to COVID-19, the federal government's focus on fraud and healthcare focused on three main areas. The anti-kickback statute, which prohibits the knowing and willful offer of payment or of solicitation or receipt of remuneration to induce or reward patient referrals. The Stark Law, which prohibits a physician from, reference, from referring Medicare or Medicaid patients for designated healthcare service to an entity with which the physician or physician's immediate family member has a financial relationship. And lastly, the False Claims Act, which prohibits the knowing submission of a false or fraudulent claim and knowingly making, using, or causing to be made or used false records. Anytime you open up a program of this importance in such a short period of time, you're opening the door to all types of fraud. COVID-19 was thrust upon us, and medical providers as well as life and law enforcement are trying to adapt to this new virtual reality. Part of the opportunity for fraud by providers comes from the fact that insurers do not have a baseline model for the types, charges, and frequency of claims generally involved in telehealth, and therefore can become more challenging to dissect. In conclusion, although the use of telemedicine has greatly expanded in response to the pandemic, all rule changes supporting the expansion have been implemented only on a temporary basis, and no jurisdiction has attempted to modify the standard of care utilized by the treating physician. The regulatory changes have focused upon who may practice telemedicine on a temporary basis, and more significantly, how telemedicine procedures must be documented in order to ensure payment through government-sponsored programs or private insurance. The efficiency of the billing procedures utilized during the pandemic will likely lead to some modifications in the scope of telemedicine if it is permanently expanded. The largest concern posed by the expansion of telemedicine appears not to be related to the quality of care, but rather to the opportunities for improper and even fraudulent billing by providers. It is reasonable to expect future monitoring work in this area will center, or center around financial improprieties committed by physicians and those responsible for their billing. So Matt Kelly, uh, we have had uh, some very high profile and very public U.S. domestic corruption cases uh, in the month of July 2020. From where you sit, what do you see uh, this trend going? And more importantly, how does it impact the compliance practitioner um, discipline? Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Tom. So, you're right. We have actually seen a string of enforcement actions involving domestic U.S. political corruption that would be absolutely FCPA misconduct, dead to rights, if this misconduct had happened overseas. Uh, let me quickly read through the string of them, because, in fact, there are now three. We had another one that just happened last night. Um the most public one, I think, so far is ComEd. They are the largest electric utility in Illinois, and they are a subsidiary of Exelon, where they just pleaded out to corruption in Illinois. Uh, they were fined $200 million. They have a three-year deferred prosecution agreement for showering favors upon the Illinois Speaker of the House, Michael Madigan. 
in exchange for Madigan shepherding favorable pieces of legislation into law for Exelon and for ComEd. Um, we should note that Madigan himself has not been charged with any misconduct, although I would humbly submit that when the U.S. attorney has to stress in a press conference that you have not been charged, it's only been serving search warrants and subpoenas on your office, you're still losing. Uh, but nonetheless, he has not been charged. We cannot say the same for the second case, which happened four days later in Ohio, where the feds did arrest Ohio's Speaker of the House, Larry Householder, for taking bribes from a separate energy company, First Energy, which I think runs nuclear power plants in Ohio. Uh, same sort of scheme. Householder and his cronies were taking bribes from First Energy uh, to push favorable legislation into law. And here we have the reverse, that the individual householder, he is under arrest, but the company involved, First Energy, um, has not been charged. Uh, but they are the company that is involved in this, and I am curious to see what might happen there. And then third, uh, which happened just yesterday, is that uh, on Thursday, July 30th, the feds indicted three men who are leaders of the MHA Nation Indian tribe uh, in North Dakota, or I should say Native American tribe in North Dakota. Um, that was a straight up like kickback bribery scheme that was alleged here. A construction firm working on the reservations would submit an invoice for $100,000 for an $80,000 project. The Indian reservation would then pay the full amount, and then the construction firm would somehow mysteriously kick back that $20,000 difference into personal bank accounts of these three men. So boom, boom, boom. We have three domestic political corruption cases that really would look like FCPA case uh, misconduct in any other scenario. Um, for whatever it's worth, it seems like Householder in Ohio seems to be the most egregious case because he is accused of outright taking bribes, where First Energy was funneling money into his pockets, where he would then buy a second home in Florida and various other nice things. I would distinguish that from Michael Madigan in Illinois, where he was asking for favors for his cronies and henchmen um, and his political associates. So that would be no-show jobs or internships for kids in his districts and things like that. So Madigan was looking more to maintain his coalitions of power in Chicago and Illinois rather than the straight-up personal enrichment that Householder is accused of. Um, and the uh, Native American tribe uh, bribery scam there, that really just reads like an episode of Longmire come to life, uh, which is a good show on Netflix if you're looking for TV recommendations. But for corporate compliance executives, I think that ComEd in Illinois is clearly the most constructive example for compliance officers to study. It really, you read through the criminal information uh, in the in DPA, and it really does read like an FCPA scam. So we had subcontractors who were the associates and cronies of Speaker Madigan. Uh, they would be hired by ComEd's third parties for various no-show jobs. And then the third party, their monthly retainer with ComEd would just mysteriously go up from 10000 a month to 15000 a month. Um, and it would all look good in your vendor payment system because it's just a master contract with a third party. But that $5,000 difference for the subcontractor, that would go into the subcontractor's pocket. And, of course, ComEd would not then know that uh, this was a no-show job. Um, really shocking behavior probably was that the former CEO of ComEd, uh, she – agreed to put an unqualified person on ComEd's board of directors, uh, where she even had relayed through one of ComEd's independent lobbyists, who was a former state rep in Illinois and a close associate of Speaker Madigan. Uh, the CEO even asked, could we put this person in a different no-show job for the same salary? But no, it had to be a no-show job on the board with that same salary. Uh, and then eventually, Actually, that happened. And this man uh, was on the board of ComEd for a year before he uh, flew the coop in April, um, probably knowing that this was a foot. Uh, you know, favored law firms, uh, favored political consultants, all hired as third parties or subcontractors. Like we've heard it all before. 
FCPA people. We all know how this goes. Um, so that really is, I think, a reminder that there are large companies in the United States with large U.S. operations and overseas operations where we drill, 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 FCPA compliant this is so important, don't do it. And then the American employees say, well, yeah, but in America, it's not a big deal because the FCPA doesn't apply and we don't have to worry about this nonsense. It doesn't happen here. Yes, it does. Uh, very clearly, it does happen here. And it can lead to serious charges either for individuals or for corporations. Um, and I think it just it speaks to the need to have one large anti-corruption compliance program. I don't care about the geographic jurisdictions. Uh, yeah. Bribery and corruption are going to get you in trouble no matter what. Um, it should be noted that ComEd actually got a favorable deal. Uh, it paid that $200, $200 million fine, which is about $40 million under the minimum amount of the federal sentencing guidelines. So how'd they get the discount? They got it because they have very seriously implemented new compliance reforms uh, since uh, this all blew up in the company space not long ago. Uh, so a lot of cooperation from ComEd with the Illinois U.S. attorney. Um, they suspended and then fired all of these third parties who were involved and the subcontractors. They have hired a new senior VP of compliance and audit, who is himself a former top prosecutor with the Chicago U.S. attorney. And so he clearly has very good connections with and lines into Chicago um, in case there is some question that the feds want answered. Uh, they will be able to get that answered from this new audit and compliance boss. Uh, new compliance policies about not hiring uh, subcontractors for consulting. Uh, new vendor management system to be able to track these subcontractor payments when they do happen. All this stuff that we have talked about ad nauseum in FCPA world, and here it is happening right here in U.S. domestic uh, corruption practices, and it's wound up uh, helping ComEd with a uh, very serious situation. Um, but it really, it does strike me that there are still U.S. employees out there who think that bribery is not something they have to worry about because they don't deal with foreign government officials. They deal with local government officials. And that's nonsense. Um, I know compliance officers pull their hair out about this because they have told me about it. Some of them have told me about it specifically after the ComEd case uh, erupted. I will be very curious to see what happens with First Energy and uh, this case in Ohio. And um, I would not be surprised if we see more of this from time to time because bribing U.S. officials for business is a crime. Just because it isn't FCPA doesn't mean you get to ignore it. Um, but that is what's going on here. Jonathan Armstrong, do you have a question for Matt? I, I actually have two. I have a, I have a, a loaded question and a genuine one. Um, sure. So, <laughs> so the loaded question, which I think you've already answered, is is part of this is the fault of U.S. corporations, isn't it? And we we have banged on before on these podcasts about people who try and teach individuals the law. Uh, they, they mistakenly think that a policy is their excuse to regurgitate what they learned in law school rather than to get people to change their behavior. And I've said to clients in the past, you know, why do you explain who a foreign public official is uh, in detail? Um, because if I'm an individual in Indonesia, you know, we've done investigations and we've said, why did you pay that private guy a bribe? They said, because the company instructed me to. Where did the company instruct you to? In its anti-bribery policy. It said, this is what a public official looks like. And I knew that what the company really meant was, if somebody doesn't match that description, pay him bookshees to get the contract. So in some respects, uh, and I've said to clients, so what you, what you really mean to say, it, don't you, is don't pay bribes, period. Don't pre you know, that's all you need to say. You don't need to tell them about the FCPA. You don't need to tell them the differences between sections one, two, and three of the UK Bribery Act. You just need a clear instruction not to pay bribes. So that's my loaded question. Do you agree? Secondly, my non-loaded question 
is I'd be interested, and you might not know, in the US, are we starting to see COVID-related uh, domestic bribery cases come through? We've seen quite a few across our uh, radar in South America, particularly, um, mostly around the purchase of uh, respirators. So in one uh, alleged purchase of respirators from a travel agency, in another, uh, a peculiar Spanish intermediary popping up to acquire respirators, uh, which, by the way, were heavily overvalued and, by the way, didn't actually work. But are you starting to see those cases come across your desk, Matt, or is it a bit too early for the U.S.? So in response to the loaded question, uh, I don't I don't think that's a loaded question. I think that's an entirely valid point, And I wholly agree. Um, I know general counsels at large corporations who view anti-corruption as we need to comply with the FCPA. And if we are because our, quote, chief compliance officer is really just, you know, the director for FCPA compliance and we're compliant with that law, then we're done. And tell that to ComEd, tell that to First Energy. I mean, clearly it's not the case. Uh, so I think that is spot on that, um, you know, it really it is not just about complying with a specific anti-bribery law. Just don't do it because you don't know which law or which agency is going to wind up biting you in the rear. Um, so I, I think the loaded question is very valid. Uh, to the legitimate question, I personally do not know of any corporations that have yet been sanctioned for, say, violations of the False Claims Act related to COVID-19 purchases. I do know that the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission have already been pursuing individuals uh, who are engaging in some sort of COVID-related scam. Uh, all sorts of scams from peddling miracle cures to taking uh, government loans for COVID with uh, no intention of spending it thereof, um, and all sorts of stuff like that. But when you think about it, a ton of government money is gushing into COVID care. There is no anti-fraud measure of any substance here. I mean, the, the, the fraud potential around the COVID spending stinks to high heaven, um, there are going to be large healthcare systems with many different vendors and procurement needs who are going to be buying materials related to COVID, and these healthcare systems will be subject to the False Claims Act. I, I, I will die of shock by 2025 if we do not see some corporate enforcement actions, either through the False Claims Act or through some other sort of avenue over Guys, what were you thinking when you were buying these res respirators for a million dollars a piece that were 3D printed out of plastic or something like that? That's going to happen. I haven't seen it yet, but I just I, there is no scenario I can envision where it won't happen eventually. Yeah. Dylan, we are now at the point of rants and shout outs. So I hope everyone has a good one. We had a very good week of news for this segment. So, uh, Mr. Marks, do you have a rant and or shout out for us? Uh, I kind of have a combination. Um, well, it's, it's both to the Institute of Internal Auditors for reconfiguring their three lines of defense into the three lines. And my rant is that I don't think they took it far enough. I think they had plenty of time to revisit this model I don't think they considered some of the regulatory items that have recently come to pass. I don't think they consider compliance appropriately. So um, while I commend them and I think it's a great start and it's certainly a good tool to be used, it, it's just that. So um, I have been noodling around and actually have, as you guys well know, I'm notorious for changing models or, or things of that nature, such as the fraud Pentagon. I have come up with my own model, which I call the um the enterprise resiliency model so um more to come on that jonathan armstrong well mine's mine's a quite chilled uh praise rather than grumble this week uh, and it's to the west indies cricket team so cricket obviously a sport that you haven't played in the uh, us for some time now 
partly because the game's too long and partly because it doesn't have enough breaks for junk food. Um, but um, the West Indies cricket team came over to revive international cricket, um, uh, which has obviously been locked down uh, through the pandemic. This involved the team firstly taking a 50% pay cut because of uh, I- issues with the loss of income for cricket, playing to an empty stadium and agreeing effectively to be locked into a hotel for a month or so, many thousands of miles from home. They won the first test in the series. They lost the second two. But without them, international cricket wouldn't have happened. And I think it's brought comfort and solace and excitement to many around the world, not just in England and in the West Indies, but also particularly, I know, in the uh, in India and Pakistan, who followed the series uh, with a great deal of interest. So well done to the cricketers of the West Indies. Jay Rosen, what do you have for us today? Uh, this comes under the category of scratching my head and asking why. Uh, from the Washington Post yesterday by Shane Harris, the Department of Homeland Security has compiled, quote, intelligence reports, unquote, about the work of American journalists covering protests in Portland, Oregon, in which current and former officials called an alarming use of a government system meant to share information about suspected terrorists and violent actors. Hey, DJT and your stormtroopers, you got anything better to do with your time? Matt Kelly, do you have a rant and or shout out for us today? Yeah, I I have a shout out uh, today to Rebecca Jones. Uh, She is the former data scientist for the Florida Department of Public Health, who was fired from her job, uh, uh, and she claims, be, as retaliation, because she, when she built a portal to allow Floridians and the public to see COVID-19 cases in Florida, uh, that she would not go along with uh, Governor Jim DeSantis and his cronies trying to play down the severity of the, co- the COVID outbreak in Florida. Um, so they were engaging in things like not counting cases or moving case numbers from one date to another to make it look miraculously like Florida was not really that bad, when, of course, Florida is now, uh, I think, officially the worst center for COVID in the United States, uh, worse than New York. And no sign of when it's going to turn around. But Rebecca Jones, when she was uh, dismissed from her job, then went out and built her own portal uh, using Florida healthcare data so people can still get the truth about the severity of the COVID outbreak in Florida. And uh, if it were not for people like her trying to do their jobs, not being afraid to stand up to uh, managers who clearly are not interested in sharing the truth with their constituents. Uh, If it weren't for people like her standing up and keep trying to persevere, who knows how much worse the COVID outbreak would be. Um, So thank you, Rebecca Jones, for having the guts to do what's right and then the brains and wherewithal to keep us all informed on your own. I don't think she's getting paid for whatever new portal she is running on her own, but uh, she's she's a credit to Florida. Uh, I am going to rant about Lou Williams. Lou Williams is an NBA basketball player who had an excused absence to leave the NBA bubble in Orlando to go to a family funeral. Uh, When returning to the bubble, uh, Lou Williams, a well-known Buffalo Wings addict, stopped to purchase Buffalo Wings, and he stopped at a gentleman's club. Tangentially, I would note, he reads Playboy for the articles. But he stopped at this gentleman club, gentleman's club to pick up wings. Uh, he ended up eating the wings at the gentleman's club and did not get them to go. And then uh, he returned to the bubble and was put into quarantine. Well, I'm tired of people hammering buffalo wings. Uh, it wasn't the buffalo wings. It was Lou Williams. So this week we had National Buffalo Wing Day. I am a full-fledged, admitted, and confirmed buffalo wing addict. So please... You need buffalo wings, don't get them at a gentleman's club. And if you do, 
get them to go. Mike Volkoff, do you have a shout out, shout out or rant for us today? Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance. The Everything Compliance gang for this episode was Jonathan Marks, Jonathan Armstrong, Jay Rosen, and Matt Kelly. If you'd like some topics explored on Everything Compliance, please send us a message via the Speak Pipe button on the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you will join us again for our next episode of Everything Compliance, where the gang will get back and look at topical issues relating to compliance and ethics. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to visiting with you again in our next episode.